Hi, Ryan. Nice to see you again. Uh, please introduce yourself. Hey, my name is Ryan Wapinko. I'm co-founder and CTO of Astronus for building small, low-cost geo telecom satellites. What is your definition of new space? Yeah, so new space uh, is an interesting question because that's obviously a, a sort of topic of debate of what that actually means, um, especially because it's you know, a fairly nascent industry. Um, I would say in general that uh, new space is the collection of companies and sort of ecosystem around that uh, who are building things in a way that is not necessarily tied to the legacy way of doing it. Uh, the legacy way of, of building things for space is that you have a set of, sort of defense contractors, uh, or at least people that are doing things in a way that, um, that was built, you know, in, with those practices and those, and, and those ways of doing things, essentially because those are the only people that could do this uh, kind of back when building the first spacecraft. And so I define new space as being the, set, the collection of companies and, and organizations and people uh, who are trying to do in many ways the same things, um, but are willing to consider other means of doing that and in general aren't necessarily selling stuff to the government, although maybe they are as well, um, but doing things primarily commercially. Okay. Can you make an example of different means? Sure. So, um, for example, uh, you know, take the, the space shuttle, which would be defined as something that's, uh, I think we would agree is very not new spacey um, and that the decisions on how, how they picked different hardware were primarily driven around the politics of ensuring that money went to, to the correct locations uh, that senators demanded. So you basically had, you know, NASA making those, those decisions on behalf of Congress uh, in order to, you know, send money out to those different contractors versus versus SpaceX, which uh, is very much a, you know, build all the things yourself, um, which is obviously the complete far end of the other spectrum, uh, and therefore making uh, decisions around sort of business and, and engineering judgment rather than around the politics of where the money has to be sent to. Ryan, your company is focusing on uh, software defense radio technology, if I'm not mistaken. Um, SDRs, uh, they've been around for quite a while. So I think the question is, why hasn't this been done before? And why should we look at uh, digital spacecraft as an opportunity to innovate in the geocommunication market? Yeah. So fundamentally, I guess we step back and look at how do traditional telecom satellites work? The way that they work is that you have, uh, they're called bent pipe spacecraft. And the reason for that is that they are effective, you know, if you imagine a pipe and you bend it into a U, then that's effectively what's happening. Uh, it's obviously a little bit more complicated than that in that you have something from your, your, your gateway and ground station, send the signal up, there's a, an amplifier that, that receives the really weak signal, takes it to a, a mixer, which mixes your frequency from the usually higher uplink frequency to the downlink frequency. And then you have a high power amplifier. Uh, and then that's used to then, um, uh, you know, beam that, that message, that signal uh, down to the ground to the user side. So, you know, fundamentally that's how, that is how telecom spacecraft generally operate. It's just basically repeaters in the sky. Um, and traditionally, uh, those mixers, I mean, they have one, one frequency per, per effective transponder or whatever, and you can't change that. And so therefore you're inherently rigid and inherently, you know, you're stuck with whatever frequency plan you have, whatever user coverage you have, kind of all of that. Um, traditionally that's been okay because traditionally most of this has been broadcast based and who needs TV and where do they need TV and all that sort of stuff doesn't change so much on the decade or even couple of decade time frame. Uh, whereas internet, as we know, does change pretty dramatically. And so that's why, you know, it's, you have this like weird dichotomy. Well, it's seemingly weird dichotomy where, uh, 
you know, demand for bandwidth and internet and all of that is just increasing over time so much. And yet over the past few years, the orders for geo spacecraft have been decreasing. Like, well, what's going on? And uh, I believe it's primarily due to that issue of, well, sure, there's all these geo spacecraft, but the market is shifting. Like people of, you know, my age demographic, we don't watch TV, we watch Netflix um, or Amazon Prime or whatever. And uh, that demographic is, is growing significantly as, you know, we get older and younger people are obviously doing the same thing as well. Um, even people of, you know, like my parents' generation are, are doing some of that, some of that as well. And so the, those market dynamics are changing uh, significantly and um, that's creating, creating a challenge there. And uh yeah, so that's that's sort of the case for that, um, for or that's that's the market side of the case for needing more flexibility, and then the other side is because these things are inherently inflexible. Each traditional spacecraft is a special snowflake, and so um, you have to build something new every single time. So there's a lot of design effort, a lot of tests, a lot of integration, and you have to do that every time, which is very expensive, very long, very slow. So can we somehow standardize the hardware much more to A, be able to have more flexibility on the ground so you can use the same or closer to the same spacecraft for each one? And can you even change it when you're on orbit? You know, the traditional spacecraft are designed for 15 year-ish lifetimes. Um, so can those change? Maybe it doesn't make sense for us to do 15 year lifetimes uh, of missions, which is an eternity um, in, in, a in a technology space. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe that isn't the right target to be using. Um, but certainly longer is more viable if you have something that's more flexible. So that's sort of where we back into software-defined radios, which you know, changes that structure a little bit in that you're not doing a, a mixing in the RF domain. Instead, you take your signal, you digitize it, the you know, ADC, uh, analog to digital converter, uh, pull that into a radio, and now you can do filtering, uh, you can do channelizing, you can do, um, you know, you're not, you're not mixing anymore. Now you're just changing uh, your digital signal processing. You're taking your signal and doing things to it, which traditionally is, um, you know, what we're doing on our first spacecraft is sort of the simplest version of that, just acting as a channelizer, which um, is, you know, fundamentally doing the same thing of mixing your signals, but mixing in a way that is entirely flexible on how you do it. Plus, you get a, f a bunch of other free features like um, the ability to do um, equalization and things like that, that that can certainly have a lot of benefits as well. Um, but really, it's primarily the, the flexibility that we're going for. Now, the cool thing is that even beyond that, there's all sorts of other things that we can look at as well. Um, you know, if you're, if you're doing a regenerative transponder, so you actually decode the message on board. Um, and then and then recode it, and that allows you to to basically clean up um, clean up any noise and, and potentially do packet routing and stuff like that. And so there's a lot of other really cool things that we can do there. Uh, the market isn't really demanding that so much right now, just because the infrastructure, the ground infrastructure, isn't built for it yet. Um, but uh, I believe that's that's what we should be expecting to be seeing in the future. Okay, uh, Ryan, uh, so geostationary orbits, uh, they have been historically the turf of uh, big companies, right? Uh, and now Astranis, Astranis comes, um, you said 90 employees, right, right now? And you're bringing a radical innovation in the market. But also, as you said, uh, the market itself is changing. Um, and I can report an experiment I do every year in my class, you know, I teach uh, space systems engineering at Skoltech. And every year I ask two students to raise their hand if they watch TV. And every year there's less and less hands showing up, right? Which, is, which actually matches your intuition, which is also my perception. Um, so definitely it's not gonna be TV, which has been the, let's say, traditional use for commercial geo. So it's gonna be something else. So perhaps, as you say, data, moving data, internet, but then you have all these Leo mega constellations, which in, in popular thought, it's where the internet traffic should go because of latency, right? Um, what's your thought about this? Uh, do you think uh, you want to compete with the Leo solutions or are you addressing a different type of internet traffic? 
I say it's more different. I think that it's actually not a particularly direct competition, um, which is actually even signaled by the fact that SpaceX and us are and, and astronomers are working together. Uh, they're launching our first spacecraft, uh, and um, the reason for that is, you know, SpaceX uh, and various other uh, fans of, of SpaceX. There's an article that was put out um, why Starlink is a really big deal. I think was the name. Uh, which had a really good analysis with flawed inputs, um, uh, which essentially made some some assertions on what price point can be achieved with LEO constellations. Um, the reality is that LEO constellations solve your latency problem that you have from GEO, but due to basic geometry and physics, um, the price point that you can achieve with um, is just so much so much higher uh, with LEO than it is with GEO just because you have to be, you know, your satellites have to be everywhere. And so therefore you need to have so many more spacecraft for your system to be able to work out. And not only that, but, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of the earth is, is ocean or otherwise unpopulated. A lot of the earth has fiber co connection and therefore Starlink is, or, you know, Leo constellation is not useful to them. Um, even in these middle ground areas, you know, the Starlink, uh, a Leo constellation is, necessarily evenly ish distributed, um, except that it, there's actually more of it probably towards the poles, um, depending on how, you, how they set up the orbital planes. Um, but, you know, it's necessarily even -ish, evenly ish distributed. Um, and so if you have peak demands or anything like that, you can't deal with any of that. So having Leo constellations is, is very important uh, for our future uh, as, as humanity, but I see it more as a complementary thing to the necessarily cheaper geostationary telecoms. And so I think in reality, you know, right now you've got most internet being served by fiber um, or fiber connections, uh, and then some amount by like ground uh, microwave terrestrial point to point, and then some amount being served by, by space. Um, and I believe it's going to be dramatically less expensive in terms of capex expenditures, in terms of flexibility, and all of that to be putting more up uh, via space. You know, there's actually pretty good math behind this uh, than by doing additional fiber outlay for for all of it, or even doing it uh, with the terrestrial point-to-point -point systems. And so, uh, what that basically means, though, is that you know, 90, 90, 95 percent of internet traffic is not latency sensitive. What we're doing right now is uh, for us to have this conversation. Now, when you go and stream this to other people, that will not be. Um, but, you know, some things in terms of video calls, video games, stock trading, whatever, uh, that, that those are, but the vast majority of traffic is not that. And so the ideal scenario would actually be that you can pump most of your data through the lower cost mechanism and then pump smaller amount of it through your higher cost mechanism. And uh, so, you know, we're, we would actually, we as a geo telecoms operator would actually be better off with the existence of a Leo network um, for, for people to be able to, you know, pay up for, for that capability as well and have less need to necessarily wait until they have fiber or microwave point to point. So you see a federated network kind of approach, right? A hybrid network. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Um, okay, uh, and what about the question of um, a small company that is uh, getting into the market of established players? How do you plan to beat them or let's say to have a competitive edge? Yeah, I mean, the key thing I think is at the beginning trying to focus on where is it that we have um, our most competitive edge. You know, we don't have the heritage that uh, a traditional operator does. We don't have the, the existing products in the market yet. And so that certainly is a disadvantage for us as a new entrant. Um, so the key advantage that we have is what are our areas where the traditional operators, traditional players rather, uh, operators being a specific term in this industry, uh, the specific players cannot compete. And uh, our first mission in, in Alaska is an example of that. Um, Alaska is a hugely underserved market, as are actually lots of places in the US um, and other you know, very developed countries. Um, have, have plenty of developed countries have have plenty of this areas where there's you know underserved internet and um, so you know Alaska is highly underserved it's a high latitude uh, country um, it's country state 
uh, it uh, has not a, you know, there's, there's not a massive amount around it that you can necessarily have capacity thrown to it from somewhere else. And so the result is just like astronomical pricing uh, of internet there. And because of that, our, our customer is basically a, a service provider in Alaska is paying absurd pricing for that. And they've been trying to get the business plan to close on a traditional spacecraft, which just hasn't been working for them because it's just really hard to make those economics work out. Um, whereas you take one or some number of, of spacecraft our size, and then that could work out for you really well. Uh, and so that's why, you know, they, that's why, you know, that, that worked out, um, you know, that whether we are bridge capacity, whether we are the be all end all of more of our spacecraft, um, you know, we could, we could serve a need right now that they were having a difficulty in serving. And so, you know, a lot of the customers that were, that were, you know, currently talking to for our first spacecraft or for our, you know, second, third, fourth, whatever, are primarily customers where either the business plan just doesn't make a lot of sense or it's bridge capacity or, um, or it's because we can move faster or, or they need the flexibility or, or something like that where the traditional spacecraft just either can't compete, um, it's not an option or, you know, the economics don't work out as well or whatever. I will put the link offsets uh, uh, in the description below. Thank you so much, Ryan, for joining uh, me today in this conversation. And uh, good luck with uh, your activities at Stranis. Thanks for having me.